So, Debian CD. I hope everybody here knows what that means. <laughs> Good, nobody's running. Right, <clears throat> so what does the Debian CD team and software do? Anyone? It's a boff, I'm not gonna talk about this stuff. <laughs> Yay, give that man a prize. Yeah, it's basically, it's the job of the software and the team to produce the, the official CDs and DVDs that, that we make in Debian. Apart from the live CDs, because trying to get Daniel to agree to doing stuff with the team is quite difficult. <laughs> Sorry, I, I did just say that on the microphone, didn't I? Oh, well. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, one of the biggest things that keeps up, that keeps on annoying me, keeps on annoying the release team, is the fact that building our CDs and DVDs takes forever. Um, I have put a huge amount of effort in over the years to try and make the process faster, but fundamentally, it is a time-consuming process just to, due to the sheer amount of data that gets moved and checksummed and copied and written, and it's all there. Um, we have, over time, started cutting down on the sets of CDs that we produce, um, at least in terms of the full-size ISO images. Um, for we, we do do the work to, to be able to create them all, but we don't bother actually shipping all of the ISO images because, fundamentally, do people really need all 38 CDs for Mipsel? Um, at the point when anybody claims that they do, I'll call them a liar. <laughs> um, so we do, we do make, try to make sure we have the first few CDs available, we have the first DVD available for every architecture. Um, and obviously for, for the ones that are far and away the most common, um, obviously i386, AMD64 and Source, we have all of them available. And we also make the Blu-ray images. Has anyone here actually used one of the Blu-ray images? No, I didn't think so. <coughs> um, they do work, honest. I, I've written a couple of them, and they seem to work. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing to test. It's a difficult thing to gauge the interest in. Not, many, not very many people have the drives or the media. Um, it'll take off. Colin? Uh, microphone. <laughs> Do we actually have anyone on, in channel as well, from outside of the, of the room? Was the intent of the Blu-ray uh, images more than anything else to be able to give them out at conferences and the like? Or was um, it intended for, did you expect wider use than that? To be honest, it was a case of, um, I saw the drives had been available for a while and thought, sod it, I'll make one. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, the media for the Blu-ray um, drives, at least at the point when I bought it last year, of course, was horrifically expensive. A single double-layer Blu-ray Blu disc was, I think, about 15 quid. I, I haven't actually written... A, a, a double layer one yet because I don't feel the need to, to burn that 15 quid. It's probably already, the, the disc will have gone off and won't work anymore. Um, I mean, it's the ones that people are going likely to give away at conferences, for me anyway, are always going to be uh, DVDs now. I'm not aware of anyone who really cares about CDs as opposed to DVDs. Please, if, if you think I'm wrong, shout, because I'm going on assumptions here that unfortunately we don't get much feedback on. Um, so for me, the, the, the main target has got to start being the DVDs quite soon. We really cannot fit um, even a, a minimal no more KDE desktop onto CD1 anymore. I know. And, and, 
there's, there, there's, and that, if, if, in fact, if people actually start doing packages that are bigger than a CD, it will totally break what we do. So, in return, yes, Phil? Uh, One, two? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, if you're putting something on a USB stick, then a DVD might well be too big. So would it be worth doing pretend double-sized CDs that are pretty useful for USB sticks or something? No. So rather than you know, having <laughs> the CD1 being bigger, or it's something like CD1 being bigger, so it's generally useful for dropping onto a USB stick. Mm. Possibly. Which size USB stick? Sorry? Which size of USB stick? Do we go for 1 gig, 2 gig, 4 gig, 8 gig? <laughs> well, if it's 8 gig, then you just put DVD one on, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's a bit of a movable feast, but uh, 1 gig is sort of throwaway money. Nowadays, yeah. uh, 2 gig, 4 gig, 8 gig all seem mm. fairly feasible. Um, obviously varies depending on where you sure. are. Sure. I mean, actually, yeah, it is a good question. Thanks, Phil. I mean, should we be targeting yet another different size of media in the middle and making images that will fit? You know, so you put your bootloader on the front and then we have something that will fill up the rest of your USB stick to make it two gig. For, for what it's worth, what, uh, it's, a, it's a very different kind of target, but what we, what we did in Ubuntu was we kept on generating CD images, but... Uh, came up with an application that turns a CD image into a USB stick and does the yeah. faffing you <coughs> need to make it work properly. Sure. Uh, so rather than having to generate another set of media, mm. we just made sure that the CD target would carry on working. Now, this is suboptimal in a few ways because yeah. CDs are smaller than almost any feasible USB sure. stick these yeah. days. So we could fit more on. I mean, that's one thing actually, was. while Joey's here, he might know. Um, at the moment, of course, we have the code um, for USB sticks that will go looking for ISO images um, on, actually on the USB file system itself and then loop back mount them and go from there. Is it feasible to actually put CD1 and CD2 in there and use them both? Okay. Could it be? You'd have, at the moment, it just loop mounts one of them. Yes, I know that. Realm, you'd have to, would it, would it be easier to have some kind of application that merges the two on and just dumps it all straight onto the USB file system? I, yeah, we could. I'm, I'm just curious as to, as to what's feasible. Um. Yeah, as Joey says, you'd have, you'd have to teach apt about doing the loop mounts itself, wouldn't you? Mm. Sure, yeah, 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 that's true. Come on. Well, forget it. Um, so, yeah, a useful thing would be to, I mean, how complicated is the application? Presumably it's a shell script of some sort, or... Wrapped up in GTK, KD. We, we uh, did a Windows front end recently. Ew! Uh, I suppose, I suppose yeah, useful. I suppose it, it's useful. It, it, these are the people who haven't installed yet. Uh, exactly, yes, <laughs> I just realised that. You have to do with um, sort of Presumably it's all free. Yes. Can we steal it? Yes. Right, yes, good. GPLs. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, th hey. I suspect that there, I think there's a patch set out standing against DI to actually make that work, but... Mm. Fine. I mean, what was I going to say? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the net inst on a USB stick is exactly what we use at work for installing all of our machines. Yeah. Um, so, actually, that move takes me on to a slightly different question. Do we still want the business card images? I ask this periodically in the hope people will eventually say no. <laughs> the business card images. I find them really useful for. I find them really useful for <laughs> testing DI, but uh, I find them really useful anything. for testing DI. I don't know if you still do, Joe. I've never really found them that useful for testing DI personally. Um, but I don't really know what the use case is. I mean, what for business card images? Mm. I mean, theoretically, there is media, but I really don't see people using it much. Do you? 
Yeah, no, not at all. Um, I mean, it doesn't hurt us a huge amount. It maybe adds about five minutes in total to, to the build. It's just, it's the extra complexity. It's an extra set of images to yeah, watch. And they, they tend to break more easily than, yeah. than edits. Absolutely, yeah, they're very fragile because, of course, the moment that anything changes in the archive, it's all broken. So, no one said, well, okay, Colin said, yes, he likes them. Does anyone who counts like I can, them? I can, <laughs> I, can, I can build that sort of shit myself if I have to. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't no, use it's good the actual generated uh, ones on cdimage.dev.org. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, are there any other images that people think it would be useful to have? I mean, I've been pondering for a while, as I said, we can't fit everything onto CD1 anymore. I don't think, I mean, I'm not convinced it's actually worth the effort of trying. Um, what do people think? You know, are the current CD1 for GNOME and KDE actually very useful? Or should we possibly g admit for the first time that CD1 on its own isn't enough? What? Uh, I actually believe that maybe a very small amount of extra application could be mm. useful on a desktop. I've been, uh, I've had a look at some other distribution and some other distribution ships extra package mm. than we do. Uh, it has to be discussed with us, sensible, but uh, to answer your question, uh, I think CD1, yeah, p who still use the CD and um, uh, maybe having a system so you can just have a CD1 which just bring a minimalist X desktop mm. and have something to let people say uh, you didn't have network so you start with your tiny uh, X or X session and you have to fix your network connectivity to be able to get the, the, the remaining stuff but really CD1 is so small. Okay. Um, I guess my experience with CD1 is that if I'm actually doing a installation somewhere where there's not good network, I'm, I make sure that I bring the DVD because I just don't want it to go off and hit the network. Yeah. And I know that it, I can avoid hitting the network, but then I'm going to get you know some minimized desktop that I'm not quite sure the state of. So sure. Um, I don't know. I I think it would be a lot easier on you know, it's on the task cell side if we didn't have to really worry about disk size quite as much as we do now. Yeah. I mean, uh, Franz and I put a lot of effort in at the end of last year to make the first DVD um, more useful. So it will cover all of the tasks for GNOME, KDE, with as many of the languages as we, as we could make fit. Even that was hard. Um, if you, by the time we want to do that for i386 and, AMC, uh, and AMD64, um, I mean, I do still like the whole multi-arch di um, disk idea. I hope other people agree with me. If not, fine, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll, di we'll drop it. Um. <coughs> the the multi-arch disk seems very useful for giving away at, at, exactly, that's at the events. Point. Yeah. I, I'd be surprised if, I mean, do you often find people use uh, people in a position where they want to use more than one of it? And more than one of the architectures available on it? Um, yes. Hmm. It, okay. To be honest, it's probably becoming moot in the fact that everything is AMD64 now. Uh, well, any, any new machine. Hardware does support ah, it. true, actually, yes, of course. The Atoms are still R386. Until yeah. we actually do multi arch the, uh, the duplicate side, yes. uh, AMD64 is sufficiently painful in user space that a lot of people avoid it. True. Actually, yeah, I mean, having said that everything's AMD64, yes, again, all the machines we install at work, they're brand new quad core boxes, but all the tool chains we get from the vendors, which is what the boxes are for, are still i386. Right, of course they are. <laughs> so, I do wish they'd fix that. So, okay, so yes, the multi arch DVD is good. Per, do you have something? Yes, we have a question from IRC. Uh, CD1 base plus sum and CD2 KD and CD3 GNOME, would that fit? Maybe. Um, one of the fun, funnest bits about trying to do clever arrangements of the bits that go on each of the CDs is 
I have no idea what, what belongs in KDE and GNOME. The task cell people have some idea, but there's, there's, there's a big flame war periodically because, well, their idea and, say, the GNOME team's idea don't quite match, and so the white applications don't get on the CD. Um, if we can come up with a good way of recognizing th things reliably, programmatically, without me having to worry about um, did GNOME make it onto CD1, for example, I'm all in favor. Um, if someone can provide patches or give me a good way, you know, a good description of what exactly to do there, then yes, great. Please, we, we can go with it. Um, I mean, quick show of hands in the audience. How many people here would actually use C a, a CD? Joey's already said that he basically wouldn't on his own. Okay, fill up the back, Will. Okay, we do have a few. Yes? When I say use a CD, I mean as in install the machine just using CD1. CD1 you mean? Yes. I can choose what is the minimum SD for booting. Fine, okay. I mean, okay, a normal full CD image. Uh, yeah, I, I quite often use CD1. I very rarely give a damn about any of the desktop stuff. Yeah. So having all the things for doing a server install on CD1 is, ah, would be okay. really useful. And it means that if for some reason the local network is screwed or the hardware doesn't have uh, drivers until you do something else, sure. then you can get something pretty useful onto a machine okay. from CD1. Right. Would it be worthwhile shift, shuffling things around in that case, make CD1 be the, not just the uh, base system, but put, include on CD1 whatever you need to actually get the rest of a system up? You know, USSH, um, open SSH server, Maybe even a compiler, is that, or is that too much? It probably is. Yeah, I couldn't tell is. you off the top of my head at the moment. <laughs> if it isn't, then CD1's pretty useless to me. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, should we actually do that and, and give up on trying to fit a full, uh, any of the full desktops onto CD1 and just say, fine, you'll need two and three probably? I have an indirect, indirect question. Um, currently, Aptitude uh, installed recommends by default recommend dependencies mm. and the city doesn't seem to, to have the s same behavior. Do we... So it seems to have the same behavior. When, is it, it doesn't behave the same way. The, when what? you install it from CD, you don't have your dependency. Yeah, the recommend dependencies, whereas mm. you would have them if you just did aptitude or synaptics. And well, is there some... That's probably because it's stable. The app does install it and that's by default. It's just changed from unstable. Mm. That's only just changed quite recently. Also, deliberately, the Debian CD code itself, when laying out the CDs and DVDs, does not look at recommends. Uh, for what it's worth, I think that's a mistake once uh, apt is installing recommends itself. Yes, oh, absolutely. Because, uh, because then very, you'll be missing things. It, well, it's also very difficult to tell apt to go back and reprocess recommends later. Yeah. So I don't think that's something we'd want users yeah. to have to do. Um, so at some point in that case, yes, we're going to basically, when we're laying out the CDs, I mean, hands up anyone here who, who knows how the, C, the, the CD code works that lays things out. <laughs> 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 yeah. Basically, it, it goes through, um, we sort the list of, uh, we work out the list of the packages that we want. Um, at the very, very first things in there are things that are required and are listed in, in Debian CD itself. So we know that we must have a couple of packages at the front just because it breaks dependencies otherwise. Then we go through whatever tasks that you, you have defined and so we pull in a basic set um, and that can, that for, for obviously for the official CDs is a fairly obvious thing straight from task cell. Um, it can also, if you're running Debian CD locally, include whatever the hell else you like. Um, and then it will, if you, know, if you do a full complete build, it will then pull in all of the information from all the packages files and will sort um, all of the packages it knows about so the dependencies are met as well as possible. Um, so you should never end up with the dependencies for something on CD4 or actually on CD7. It's sorted, you know, appropriately. The moment we start having to take recommends into account, the only sensible thing we can do is treat them as depends. 
in terms of how we lay out the CDs. I have no idea how much that's going to break things. We, we certainly found an Ubuntu it blew things up a reasonable amount. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't completely mm. unreasonable, but it did require some handling. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm still very happy, it must be said, at how well we do cope with the dependency sorting and the fact that apt, uh, aptitude, whatever, do the right thing in terms of they know which packages you want and where they are, so you only have to feed each disk once. I was horrified to play with a Fedora install quite recently while well, watching somebody else at work do it, and it's, it's shuffling disks like crazy. And why? It's, oh, it's not hard. <laughs> well, I don't think it's hard. Hey, hey, we manage it, so it can't be that hard. <laughs> so, yeah, at some point, um, again, I guess we will need to start think, thinking about recommends as though they're depends. That is probably going to utterly destroy any chance of putting a useful graphical desktop on CD1. Um, just a heads up. I mean, I, I hope nobody here is going to disagree with that. They're going to argue. Petter? I'd rather we started using uh, recommends as depends when building CDs sooner than later to make sure that we actually can weed out these problems for the yes, squeezes. Yes, absolutely. Squeezes. And yes, it will increase it a lot, but mm. after all, recommends are supposed to be installed. Yes. And there are, well, there are so many packages with crappy recommends at the moment. So we just mm. need to find them and fix them. Agreed, absolutely. Again, I hope somebody's taking notes about all this, because I'll have forgotten who you are and what we spoke about in about 20 minutes. Um, so, recommends going in. People stu to do still like CD1, but I, I honestly don't think it's going to work well for desktop for much longer. Um, is it worth us still trying to make it that happen, or do we do we admit failure, or is that something, we, uh, or is that something we, we should do the numbers for once we once we move to recommends? Possibly. I be? mean, what we've done, yeah, it would possibly be worth going with a lightweight desktop, yes. I mean, we already have the third option for CD number one, which is to have the LXDE slash XFCE. Um, and that works quite well. You get a lot more other packages on the CD because you don't have so much, I hesitate to call it crap, but you don't have quite so much other stuff just needed for the desktop. Um, that, may, that might work for... Um, initial CD1, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll have a look. Uh, if we move to recommends, is that going to take more or less than four months to fix? That's a very good question. Um, I can turn it on tomorrow yeah. and yeah, and wait for the <laughs> breakage. <laughs> Fair enough. Another point about recommends is that uh, having them on the CD will make the CD behave more like the network installation because yes. all the packages are on the network. Yeah. Um, yeah, what else was I going to talk about? In fact, right, does anybody else have, have anything to bring up while I think about that? <laughs> um, are there any particular modifications to what we do that people would like to see? Um, <laughs> uh, maintaining a simple CDD, which Mm. It's largely a wrapper around Debian CD. Yeah. It, uh, it generates a customized CD. Um, the way it's handled during release cycles is kind of terrifying. Um, <laughs> three days before the final freeze, yeah. there's a new Debian CD out. And I'm like, well, I can test it with Subversion, but if yes. there's one change that I missed... Yeah, apologies for that. It's, it, it has always been the way. It probably will continue to be the way. I don't like making changes just before release, but Sod's Law says that there will be something changes in the archive that we've got to cope with in the last week. Debian CD is typically one of the very last packages to be um, installed in the archive just before the release. Uh, actually, having seen how this works, um, I can tell you that there are possibilities to install packages in the archive, even though we told people there are no uploads anymore allowed. Yes. So we can just hand push packages, and I think that has happened to CD already yes. more than once. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, ob ob and obviously it's necessary. So mm. from at least 
well, at the time when I was a list manager, I said, well, it's not a real risk for us to do it because we know that the package has been properly tested. Mm. We have the things, and if it breaks, well, Steve is out anyway. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not too good, but well. Ah, cool. Uh, most of the Debian CD changes are, uh, most of the very late ones are task changes, aren't they? Uh, that kind of thing, yes. Um, would, it, would it be worth considering moving that out of the source code and making it something that's uh, a property set in the archive, uh, exported in packages files rather than Maybe. done in tasks, um, just to try to reduce the amount of Well, in fact, as time has gone on, um, we actually... Again, one of the things that Franz and I put a lot of effort in just before the end of last year was we, f we finally got away from, you try to get away from using the task cell stuff shipped in the package. Right. Um, so we generate as much as we can automatically. Okay, that's um, good. Of course, we do want to make sure that it, it, you can't win here. We then also wanted to make sure that the stuff that was in the package matched closely what actually shipped in Lenny, so people without net access, without everything, could generate sure. a, a similar looking CDs afterwards. Uh, sorry, I had a, I had a uh, separate question about uh, um, the publishing that we do. Uh, we do things like BitTorrent tracking of yes. CDs, don't we? Um, how, do we how do we find the uh, tracker software that's Oh, used? it's all crap. We've found an Ubuntu <laughs> that's all dreadful. Is yes, there, it really is. Is there anybody uh, working on anything that is I not honestly don't know, please. <laughs> sucky? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we've, we found, especially during the Lenny release, that we got a whole load of friendly people all over the world with nice fast connections, and we told them, yes, please help seed. And, and then the tracker fell over. <laughs> and yeah, then the tracker fell over. Or all these people, yes, you know, were, were, were running seeders, and the seeders just would randomly get bored and, st and stop doing anything. And nobody understands why. And it, it's just crap. Is this worth a summer of code idea for next year? Oh, God, yes. Right, one that is not dreadful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or if anyone knows of anyone who is working on a good torrent um, infrastructure co um, code, please, God, encourage them. <laughs> um, we deliberately generate, um, as part of the weekly CD build, and also, obviously, of the official... Um, betas and releases, we deliberately make sure now that we generate a torrent to go with everything, we gen generate Z-Sync Z files scattered all over. Um, basically, whatever we can do to help people download stuff without hammering or bandwidth totally is good. Um, if there's anything else that we could do there, I'm willing to listen. I know I have had Metalink folks um, talk to me several times. Do you yeah. have any experience of that? We had uh, we had people wanting Metalink for uh, uh, Windows-based downloaders. Apparently, it works better. Uh, we we did start generating them. Uh, we turn we we avoided most of the really scary features of Metalink. It has okay. uh, it has several kind of server hammering features, like opening multiple connect connections at oh, once. That's no. <laughs> so uh, we arranged for that. I think you can turn most of that off in the Metalink file. Right. Uh, we just gave it a really simple uh, mm. file that's essentially just a wrapper around BitTorrent. And that seems to work OK, from okay. what I understand. Cool. Um, but it is a bit of a pain, mm. and they could just be using the torrents. Sure. Um. Do you have a question? What do you think about adding the translation file to the CD? I understand ah. that there are some yes. size issues for yes. the CD, sure. but there are also other uh, media, mm. like the DVD. Uh, just for information, the, the, the whole BZ2 uh, files, it's seven megabytes currently. Mm. And per language? No, 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 the, the full. The full oh. list, it's currently seven languages. And okay. The German one is uh, 1 1.2. Okay, cool. And there are 30 yeah. languages. Sure. I remember you asking this before we did Lenny and saying, yes, I'll have a look, and I failed. I'm sorry, I was crap. There are also some time <laughs> issues. <so. laughs> yeah. Um, we would really, I would really like to put the translated packages, uh, for d package data onto each of the CDs and DVDs as well. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than just dropping the existing translated file. Um, again, I'll, I'll describe a little bit why. The way that we build up 
a CD these days is um, we actually generate a temporary ISO image um, just to size things. We then go through the, um, and iterate through adding packages, guess to, guessing how, bi how big it's going to be, and then periodically actually generating again the ISO image just to test the size, keep going, keep going, keep going. So when we add a new package, um, we, may, we have to make sure that it's available for um, the architectures in the right order, and ditto source is considered an extra architecture there. But also, I mean, this is yeah, probably more detail than you need. The other thing that goes on along with the package is its entry in the packages file. And then, of course, we have to recompress the packages file to make the packages.gz, the packages.bz2. Um, don't know if we actually do the bz2 or not. Um, if we want to do the translations to match, of course, I will, we will then have to go through and add the equivalent entry in each of the, the language versions. Um, when the way that we know that a CD is full is that suddenly is that we had a package that doesn't fit anymore, and so we actually have code. And I'm really it's horrible, nasty code. I wish somebody could would volunteer to come and have a look, but my pearl isn't very good. Um, once we actually overflow and know that the CD is too full, we actually go back and undo it all. We remove the package, we remove the package's entry, we, we, so we'd have to do the same thing in all of the different languages as well. That was why I said, yes, we'll do it, and then went quiet. <laughs> um, it may sound like a horrific way of doing things, um, but what we used to have was a real problem where we would guess up front what would fit on a CD. Oh, cut that in. We'd guess up front what would fit on a CD, we'd get right to the end of the process and say, oh crap, it doesn't. Um, well, and we, used to, we used to just have hard-coded uh, fudge factors in Debian We CD did, and it was always total guesswork. We'd end up with, some, with, with a CD that might be a megabyte bigger than what we'd be happy with, and it's a case of, uh, do we, don't we? Um, because of course, if you're doing a very large set of CD images, you only going to realize at the end of the run that CD 17 doesn't look the right size. If you want to redo things, you then end up got to tweak your fudge factor or tweak your maximum CD size and rebuild the entire set. That just does not work at all anymore because of going, going back to the Woody days, for example, we, we ended up on some of the point releases spending an entire week tweaking the CD sizes to make sure that none of them was too big, but to try and avoid having the 35 megabyte image on the end that just would be a total pain. So one of the, the, one of the reasons why I moved over to the sizing what, by doing Genizer image for Debian CD for version three was to move away from that. We can now know exactly how big a, a blank CD is, exactly how big a blank DVD is, and we can test the sizes of what we've built against those, and we know exactly is it going to work or not. If you look at the sizes of the typical um, CDs in, on CD image, you'll see that most of them are within a megabyte of full. Um, obviously, that means that over 35 CDs, the chances are we just saved somebody a blank. You know, we've saved somebody from having to carry out around an extra CD. And of course, the more packages we've got, the more important it is to pack them in, in tightly. So, yeah, it's hard. If somebody wants to prepare patches for the translated um, package tran um, descriptions and stuff, that would be wonderful. I think we already have a script which can receive a package file and provide a translation file for matching this packages file. Okay. That'd be cool. Something I can attach to bug. Cool. Um, now, again, for performance reasons, we don't go looking up the, the details about each package um, as we're running. Um, we actually, in Debian CD, in the middle of the dirty great pearl, lump of pearl that lays out the images, we suck in the entirety of the package's file up front. So all we're doing is just writing out data that we already have in memory. Um, we will end up having to basically have an array of those one for the main one, and I guess an, you know, another um, entry for each of the uh, translated descriptions, maybe. Yes. Ah, am I dying?
Oh, okay. Fine. Excellent. Right. Can you hear me again? Yeah, it sounds good, I suppose. Um, what else? Yes, um, jig do stuff. Do people still find it useful? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, good, okay. I mean, have you guys actually moved over to the new Debian CD uh, yet? Or are you still doing really, really old stuff? We unfortunately haven't, and this is because I haven't figured out how to cope with the subversion to Git switch for our revision control yet. Um, we will get there. Subversion to Git? Are you? I thought you guys. Ago. We're on uh, the last code just before it moved to subversion. Uh, moved to Git. We're not in Git. Or oh, sorry, so CVS to subversion. Oh, okay, That's fine. <laughs> But I say, I'd love to pick, move to get. Pick, pick, pick your pair of revision control systems. <laughs> Fine, okay. Um, so we have to we have to cope with that. I'd really love to, but it's oh, been come on, oh, come it's, it's come been on. somewhere in the pile. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, um, it doesn't bite us all that badly because we are stressing the we don't have these uh, you know twenty CD sets. Sure. And so uh, we can essentially afford to deal with it. Mm. It is a bit of a pain, but. Um, but it's okay. tolerable. So, um, sizing is become, going to become even more important. If we're going to go, going to go for recommends, if we're going to go for translated package descriptions, um, we're about to kill CD1. I don't think it's going to work for much longer. So at that point, actually coming up, maybe even with a hand-picked set of packages that we really want on CD1, um, and then we lay out beyond that, is probably going to have to happen. Again, so if we can get the DI folks to allow us to have more than one ISO image on a USB stick, or if we can um, go for the um, Ubuntu style, you know, relay things out, grab things from the first couple of images. I mean, back in the dim and distant past, when I first started on the Debian CD3 stuff, you might remember this was back in like Helsinki, my plan was very much that we would uh, um, include in the Debian CD package um, a tool to allow you to pick, it, pick out an existing image that already, you've already downloaded and basically roll back the last few packages that went on so you could make yourself extra space to put on whatever else you wanted. I haven't got that. I don't know if I ever will. If so, well, all of the information that you need to be able to do that should be on the CD. Um, it's just a case of doing it. If anybody ever, uh, is really looking for something to dive in, but I mean, I don't know, if, would this be useful for the CDD stuff, or not? So, you're talking about just freeing up a little... Yeah. You're talking about freeing up a little space at the end of the disk to put other junk in. Yes. Um, most of the stuff that Simple CDD uses is already in packages, so sure. it oh, should absolutely. already be handed by, it. there's like a, mm. a few scripts or something. Oh, yeah. No, so. what I'm saying is it's not necessarily just adding whatever random files onto the CD you want, but it could be specifically, um, we've, we've gone through and filled up the entire CD image with packages, but you may want to roll back the last 20 to add on specific packages, say for Debian Edu or, if, or for what, whoever else has their own set of packages. I mean, I don't know if it's useful or not, if it's just pie in the sky idea, um, but it does mean you could start off with an official CD and then just tweak the very last few things on it. For Debian Edu, it will not be useful because we need to change completely the list of packages on the CD. Fine, okay. In that case, I'll stop beating myself up about it. Um, the Jigdo stuff people say is still useful. One of the things that I'm going to be doing, <laughs> I was going to do this week, yeah, like I was going to get the time, is moving or at least porting over the Jigdo generation code that is currently in CDR kit into, um, oh, the, not libcdio, the libburn, yes. There is an ISO um, image generating program to go with that. And really, uh, wandering off topic slightly, I, Speaking as one of the upstreams of CDR kit, I would like to see it go away and actually throw away all of the shilly-related code we have in the archive. 
how well does uh, Libburn work for the sort of niche stuff like uh, HFS hybrids? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. Yeah. At the moment, they just don't. Um, it's a hard problem. I mean, it to is, be honest, it is. It's a, the yeah. code in, in MacIS uh, mm, is exactly. inevitably a mess. Yeah, it is. The, the, uh, uh, are people aware of? Do people know what we mean by um, HFS hybrid? <laughs> I'll, ex uh, the I'll explain briefly. Um, basically, if you want your CD to boot on a Mac, if you want all the long file names and various other bits and pieces to work on a Mac. You can't just use ISO 9660 like you can for the rest of the world. You've also got to um, put a whole extra parallel set of file system descriptors in the disk that make it look a bit like HFS. It's not quite HFS, really, but if you squint and look, look askance at it, Yes, it comes out looking much the same, so Max will deal with it. I wish they'd just and give up and do something portable. I don't know if, uh, so that, that was for the PowerPC Mac world. Yes. I don't know if this has changed since last time I looked at Intel Max. It may have yeah. done, but when I last looked at Intel Max, you still couldn't do, you still couldn't boot straight off ISO 9660. Uh, you had to have HFS plus hybrid. And nothing that I know yes. of does. I, I don't even know of sure. software to uh, generate a bootable HFS plus image at all, yeah. let alone a hybrid. Please, God, will somebody just go and slap them till they stop doing this shit? <laughs> if, if, you, if you prod EFI in weird ways, I mm. think you can eventually yeah. get it to boot off ISO, but it doesn't really like it. Yeah. So basically, the problem is for uh, this was first a problem for us with M68K. We had to do all kinds of horrible and moral things to the image to make it boot on M68K Max, Amigas, and Ataris. To be honest, the 68K had gone away as far as we're concerned. We stopped making images for it a while ago. But of course, as Apple moved on to PowerPC, this means that every image that we create for PowerPC has HFS hybrid options turned on. A, that means that it slows down the, um, the generation code a lot. Um, the source code for doing the HFS hybrid inside MacIsoFS, both the old version that we port, we've ported from and still in current versions, is it's utterly shit. It really is. Um, when you start generating large images, um, when we first started doing DVD images, um, I, I caused so many crashes in that code, it was untrue. Um, the reason that we haven't generated any Blu-ray size images to go on PowerPC is because that code just fails. Isn't that just, uh, I, I seem to remember there's a, there's a knob that says you need to make the HFS uh, file descriptor table this big. Yes, and in uh, the end it, it, it came down to that, yeah. Mm. Um, but the actu if, you actually, if you actually have to look at the code inside though that does it. Yeah, about four years ago. Um, it ends up recursing, it goes through. As you generate your HFS hybrid, um, descriptors, the size of various um, lumps inside the HFS volume area, I think, I forget the exact terminology, changes. So um, as you get a larger and larger image um, and you start growing things, you can end up spending whole minutes inside um, Genizer image just calculating the sizes of that stuff. So the PowerPC DVDs take about four times as long to make as the i386 ones do, for exactly this reason. It's nasty. So I would love to just give up on it, and I was hoping that the, uh, Apple would have seen sense with the new Intel-based stuff, but apparently not. But it's not like there's anything we can do with it. Yeah, like, like I say, I last, I last looked at this uh, relatively, it was a year or so after Intel Max yeah. came on the scene. And uh, it was still very early days. You had to, they didn't ship with boot camp by default yet at that point. Um, yeah. So it, it is possible that the, w the universe has become a little more sane since then. Fine. Sure. Um, I mean, so along with the jig do patches that went into MacIsaac FS at the time, um, there's also a whole load of stuff in there to support booting from several of the, the other architectures. Um, I know Steve Langerschek got involved with that even more so, which is how we managed to end up with the hybrid HPPA IA64 Alpha CD. They actually all need pointers in the, f in the first boot block 
um, pointing to various files on the desk, but we actually worked out a way where we could interleave that, those pointers without confusing anyone. And Oh, it's horrible, but it does work. But as MacIsoFS and now GenIso image, frankly, are going away as far as I'm concerned, they're legacy only, somebody somewhere is going to have to forward port a whole load of that code into, and I'm going to, it's really crap, I can't remember the name of the, of the libburn attached um, ISO image tool. Nor can I, sadly. Uh, there have been bugs filed against Libburn asking for HFS hybrid support for about three years, I think. Yeah. So we probably just need to. Somebody needs to do it. Pay the uh, Libburn upstream or something. I don't know. Or something, yeah. But so and I, I can't really imagine anyone else is going to do the porting of this, of all of the jig do curve and whatever. So I said, that was, my, that was my work plan for this week. And then people got me to do all the talks, and it's all your fault. <laughs> um, so that, I'm hoping, might happen before squeeze. Um, but it does need me to spend a couple of weeks on porting over that code. And I'm hoping that the Libburn uh, backend is reasonably portable and, and is nice and easy to follow. Please. Right, any other questions? Any, any other comments? Any other ideas? Really? Um, Mike. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, regarding the bootloader for E386 or AMD64? Yeah. Um, just any, any uh, about having language, uh, multi-language support or uh, improvement, maybe something like being able to display uh, help screen on the front page. Uh, are there any progress in I might upstream? Be um, able to help oh. with that unless you heard. Oh, go for it. Um, we were talking on Dash Boot recently about doing uh, a GFX boot front screen since uh, that's now actually supported by SysLinux um, or by SysLinux upstream. Uh, so that would give us that kind of ability. I'm not quite sure where it sits between the installer mm. and Debian CD. It's somewhere in the grotty uh, intersection. Yeah. The way that we currently handle um, the configuration files for SysLinux is a bit scary. Um, <laughs> let's be honest. The, the DI folks have a whole load of different snippets of config for, do, for working with the graphical menus and stuff that inside Debian CD we then do a whole massive set of horrible munging with. Franz, again, worked on this when I was with him at the tail end of last year. So this is how we can generate um, a set of menus that will match what's on the CD, whether it's a GNOME or KDE or a combination. Um, if we want to start doing that with the graphical image as well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that it makes very much difference what the front end looks like there. There, okay. is, there is some horrible. Oh, does SysLinux end up doing font rendering and stuff then? What what you can do is you can get you can get the uh, you can get the graphical front end thing to read through the SysLinux menu files and do the right thing. Oh, based okay, on what's fine. Oh, there. yay, easy. Uh, there's some. It's it's not quite as easy as all that, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, there's sure. It, it's not necessarily utter doom and Debian CD. Okay. It's only mild doom. That's fine. We do. We can deal with that. Yes, we have a few. <coughs> sorry, we have a few questions on uh, IRC. Okay. Um, if I can find it. If you can call out names as well to go with them, that that will be appreciated. Just uh, so I know. M R V N. Okay. okay. Fine. Uh, Goswin. Will CD DVD one have some space for firmware, or will there be a CD DVD image with non-free? That's a very good question. Um, one of the things I was hoping we would have out of discussion after the Lenny release, um, my own preferred way for things to go would be that we would have a firmware section that we could then agree as a project would fit on the first CD or the first DVD, and then that would make the, make the question moot. Um, we haven't had that. I don't know if it's going to happen. So what we have at the moment is probably going to carry on f for, the, for the foreseeable. Joey put work into DI. I put a little bit, a tiny bit of work into Debian CD to match up. And that is the extra small downloadable lump of firmware um, that we, we currently have. 
until we end up with a better solution for the firmware, we're probably going to carry on with the same route. Ready for the next one? Yeah. Okay, PCC uh, asks, what compression method is currently used? Would it help uh, to use something like LZMA? Compression for what? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> if you can, if you can c clarify the question, that would help. We can take another one. In the yeah, meantime. by all means. Um, the mill asks if all the IA64 images could print a message saying, use the AMD image, AMD64 image, you idiot. Yes, that would be, it's something that people have suggested before. I don't know how to do it. Um, in theory, it should be feasible to put a normal i386 style um, El Torito boot image on the front of the IA64. So if you attempt to use it, So if you, if you attempt to use it on a non ia 64 machine, then it will print, it will just come up with, uh, it will run something that says, you've got the wrong CD. Yes, that should be doable. Patch is welcome. I have no idea. Colin. Just one, the last, the clarification. Well, uh, Colin, respond. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it would probably also help to look through the, uh, the website side of things and improve things there, since by the time somebody's already downloaded an IS64 CD yes. and burnt it and boosted it, they're probably already pretty, pretty yeah. pissed off. So I mean, sure we, do, yeah, we do get it. The, the two most common questions we get in Debian CD or in Debian wah, 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 about the images are, help, why is this DVD only 400 megabytes? Because, because people have downloaded it using crap software or they're using FAT32 and it doesn't work. And the second one is, I've downloaded the 64-bit image, why doesn't it boot? Exactly as the question is, as you just forwarded. Um, so yes, we, we should really do that too. Um, there was a further question, which of course I've, further option there, which I've just totally and utterly forgotten. Um, somebody else had come up with some extra ideas on clever stuff we could do with El Torito boot. Um, it'll come back to me probably just after we finished. Okay, next question. Uh, just to clarify, the compression question was about the devs. So oh, Debian the devs. Packages. Fine. Yeah, at some point we'll, we, will, we already have support, I believe, for using LZMA and whatever. Yes, of course, as, we, as the devs themselves get smaller, we'll get better, but more stuff on the CDs. Yes, we like that. It's, uh, it's easy to do that selectively. I'd caution against trying to do it across yeah. the board. In many cases, it doesn't actually save in, in small cases or mm. particular classes of uh, files, it doesn't save much. And you do have to be quite careful about memory consumption with sure. Elsa Domain. Right. I'm told that we're out of time. I will. I will cheat and say w one more point, Petter. Uh, regarding uh, compressing, I think uh, the time is better spent fixing the compiler to make well the same size image uh, binaries it used to do in Woody or mm. patch. Binaries has just been blowing up in size uh, yes, with no have. obvious improvement. So, so right. If there are any more questions, obviously. I'll be around on hash Debian CD or on the Debian CD mailing list. If anybody did get notes of all of this, please forward them on, otherwise somebody's gonna have to watch the video. And I hate looking at myself on video. <laughs> I've got one line followed by Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, bye. <laughs>